<laughs> I'll take it. Are you sure you're not interested? I was like, ah, don't ask me again. <laughs> and it's a bad hair day, too. <laughs> so she's like, scream for me, and then it's just dead silence. <laughs> it was a good uh, uh, risk to take, and it, it was great. <laughs> Boom! Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna try to give you a friend, and then I was, I was like, oh. I was like, I wish you had like a granny mask. That would be so cool. Or like Hello. a ghost uniform. <laughs> and everybody was like totally uh, freaked out. Hi. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, Mark. I get to everything because I'm very excited to talk to him. My guest today is a talented filmmaker. His current documentary, Olympia, which is based on the Academy Award-winning actress, Olympia Dukakis, is available now. Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, Harry Mavro McAllis. Hi, Harry. Hey, Mark, how are you? I'm doing really well now, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm so sorry for the scare. <laughs> no problem at all. You're here and I'm here and I understand things happen. I make mistakes all the time. So it's, it's all good. Good to be here. Yeah. So um, I, I can't wait to talk about the film and some of the things behind it because it sounds like my, uh, my limited understanding is that it wasn't like you had set out as a goal to say, I'm going to make a documentary about Olympia Dukakis. It kind of sounds like things kind of fell into place in um, a different kind of way. Can you kind of talk about the origins of how you started this film? Yeah, you know, I had the, um, the, the good luck to meet her. She was supposed to teach at NYU. I signed up for her class. The class didn't happen, which um, I was devastated because, you know, I wasn't going to meet her. And at the time, I had a production company in Cyprus. So I went through the head of the department and invited her to come to Cyprus to do a workshop. And she said, yes, she came to Cyprus. We spent two weeks together where I would take the class all day and then you know at night I was her you know her tour guide um, and we became friends and uh, a year later I was at the film screening watching the Carol Channing documentary and uh, the film ends I'm like loving the film and I turned to my husband and I said you know somebody needs to do a documentary about Olympia and uh, he said well why don't you do it you're a filmmaker so that's how the idea got into my head then you know, I had to pitch it to her. I, you know, after loving the idea and, you know, uh, uh, and she said, no, she wasn't interested in doing it. And for three months, you know, the more, you know, the more you, somebody tells you no, the more you want to do it. Um, and then for three months, I, I kept trying to convince her and she kept saying no. Um, and, you know, finally it was when I, you know, I, I realized that it wasn't happening. And I went to her apartment and I said, you know, Olympia, I, I just... Doing this documentary would mean that I would spend more time with you, really. That's that's why I want to do this. And she turned around and she said, sure. She said, I, I can do it for that reason, you know, for the, all the other reasons that you were giving me before. Um, but uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just, what I knew it was that I just wanted to film her, film her in different aspects, you know, rehearsing with her family. And then I was like, okay, I'll figure it out <laughs> once I get into the editing room. That's, that's, see, that's interesting to me that uh, you knew that you wanted to do certain things in terms of filming things, but it wasn't like you had something completely storyboarded out and this is the narrative that I have. It's just like, no, I want to capture these things and we'll figure out the rest of it later. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, because it's hard to have a narrative when you're shooting somebody who's um, alive and you're doing cinema verite. Oh, I knew what I... I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want a, a factual, you know, documentary, your typical bio dog that she was born here and then she did this and this and this. Um, I wanted to capture her essence and how she is as a person. So that entailed a lot of filming. I mean, we had, we have, I think, 250 hours of footage of which I had to then go in and, and basically create a 90 minute story. I can only uh, talk to some other uh, film directors and actors and things. I've been very lucky during this time. And 
almost all of them say, and I, I, I'm guessing this might be the same case in, with your film, that what they started out with and what they ended with are two different things. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, and it sounded like um, like you kind of had uh, looked at maybe like trying to film for two years and then ended up attacking on like a third year because of some events that were taking place, like the star on the Walk of Fame and also traveling back to Greece. Exactly. Uh, okay, so uh, there's so many things I want to ask about this, but when you said you had 250 hours of footage, how long did it take you to edit all that stuff down? Because that must just take forever. It took forever because both the editor and myself were first time feature length documentary filmmaker. So it was kind of like the blind leading the blind. And um, apart from having that many hours. And so it took us about two, two years and three months, um, just so you can understand in comparison, like I spoke to Penel Penelope Falk who uh, edited the John Rivers documentary. And I said, how long did it take you? And she said about 12 months, um, you know, when it's, when it's, when you're following someone, it's it's harder, but you know, twelve months versus twenty six months, it's a little, you know, it's a big difference. It, it is, and it's still even twelve months sounds like a heck of a long time. Which I, I mean, it's understandable, but still, yeah. like, oh my gosh, um, yeah. I've only done you know very very small just things for fun, like with my phone or whatever, and I'm just trying to edit that stuff. And it's like, man, I just like the filming part. I don't want to edit all this stuff <laughs> together. You know, that's how, that's how I was at the beginning, too. I didn't want to be involved in the editing. And then what, what I realized was that if I wasn't there, it was going to be somebody else's film. Um, and I was dreading it. I was dreading going into the editing room. And after, I think, two weeks, I was hooked. I, I, every morning, I would wake up excited to go into the editing room and work with the, you know my editors. And so I'm glad. I'm glad that I was able to do that. Well, yeah, and, and that makes sense. I mean, it seems like um, if you weren't there, then it starts becoming someone else's narrative, really, because they can put anything they want together in any kind of storyline, really, a narrative. And then you can look at the finished product for like a final saying, like, wait a minute, that's not what I envisioned or what I wanted things to do. So it makes perfect sense that you were there. Well, you know, well, it was also stemming, I think, from insecurity. Like, just I don't know what I'm doing. If I, you know, if I put my head in the ground hopefully if I pray hard enough, the film will come out and it will be great, you know, like if, but I won't be responsible, you know, but once you, you know, go through that insecurity and you're like, no, you really have to be there. And, you know, and because it, it's hard, it's hard. There's days that, you know, everything that you've tried was a disaster and you leave and you go home and you feel like a, you know, a failure and, you know, horrible with yourself. And then there were certain days that you're like, Oh my God. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, but, um, you, you know, it, it was a learning experience. I, I, you know, I'm shooting now my second documentary and already as I'm shooting it, I can visualize the story. Whereas with Olympia, because it was my first film, I had no idea, no idea. Yeah, no, that, and you make an interesting point because of like these virtual interviews for myself. I've I started doing these back in May, and prior to that, I had never done one ever. So the the first few, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any confidence. Um, they're still on my YouTube channel, so you can see that my voice was actually higher because I was so nervous trying to talk to <laughs> the, the camera. Um, the interview part I was fine with because I had done that for many years, but just this whole weird technology piece, like where am I supposed to look? And <laughs> I see these comments coming through and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, on a small scale, I can relate to that, that initial, I don't know what I'm doing feeling. Yeah. And then once you kind of get past it, then it starts to kind of get, at least for me, it's hard to get good to me. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, now I'm kind of hooked onto this and I want to keep doing it and try to get better and improve it and yeah. nip and tuck it where I can and all that kind of thing. So yeah. it's like you said, it's a, it's a work in progress, a learning curve for sure. And, and it's the and it's the you know mistake that most of us make as artists where we think that we should go into making a film seeing the result because the great masters have seen the the end product as soon as they started filming and it's like no no one did <laughs> you know everybody had a process everybody had a highs and lows and the sooner that you can you know have some grace and some forgiveness be good to yourself then. It, it, all of a sudden it starts getting a little easier because we're so harsh. We're so strict with ourselves and so judgmental, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, I do know that you're right. Every, I think every artist is the, their biggest critic. Yeah. Uh, 
And again, one of, I was very fortunate to talk to a film director from Germany, and his first feature took him over six years. And that, the first thing out of his mouth was, don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he actually had to change his narrative on the fly because the footage he had didn't fit the newer footage and everything oh. was just, uh, yeah, he was like, I learned so much during that process, though. But he said, if I'm talking to a brand new filmmaker, I said, don't do this, don't do this, yeah. don't do these things. It'll make your life a lot easier. But even yeah. then, it's still part of the process. You know, you have to fail at some point to fail forward. That's OK. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You fail, if you take steps backwards, then it's like, well, kind of figure out what you're doing so you can keep moving forward with it. Because um, then, you, yeah, you'll you'll learn from it for sure. And um, I'm curious when you had when you were spending so much time with Olympia Dukakis, was there ever a time when she said like, turn the camera off, get out of here, leave me alone? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Um, I mean, she especially when she was rehearsing, and she was at a place where they were working on a play. Um, and the camera was hanging out a little too long and she needed her time and space to, you know, rehearse with her, by herself, then she would lose lose it and be like, okay, I got that, we're done, get out. You gotta get out now. And I'm like, wait, wait, one more question. No, 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 out. <laughs> um, yeah, but other than that, um, she was a great sport. You know, she she hated having us there. I really don't think, except when we were in Cyprus, uh, and Greece, we had, you know, for whatever reason, she enjoyed us being there. Um, but most of the places, she was like, "Oh, you know, <laughs> oh, the film people are here." <laughs> um, but I mean, it's it's invasive in a way, you know, like, and as natural as she is, you know, the, it's in the back of your mind. The camera is there. Right, and um, yeah, but uh, yeah, thankfully she she allowed us to to do our thing. Okay, and just um, on average, like how big was your crew that was following her around? How many people? Oh, it was it was huge. It was basically the cameraman, and then sound, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was two of us. There was I, I, you know, I didn't have any money. So I, the three years of production of shooting, I shot it on American Express uh, on my, you know, on my uh, credit card, and um, there was no room for anyone else, you know, financially. So I did sound. I tried to, you know, be the director as well, <laughs> um, and then my my camera person Ryan Johnson um, and. Uh, Federico Seska, I had two people, um, depending on where we were. So yeah, just two of us. Okay, and so with that enormous crew, was, was there ever a time when you, when you decided, hey, we should turn the cameras off? Oh, I mean, you mean because there was a... Um... Yeah, just something going on that maybe you thought, well, you know, this is too private or something that, you know, we've been here long enough, we should give her her space but before she had oh. this to you. Yeah, there was there was a there was a time when there was some family issues and she was on the phone with, you know, talking to somebody from her family and it was getting personal. And uh, I, I said, OK, let's let's get out of the room. And, you know, um, because there, there, there was one thing that she said from the very beginning, you do not have access to my children. Um, that's the only thing that I'm asking. Anything else goes. And I said, fine, you know, that's fine. So when that happened, I, you know, I just we removed ourselves, let that let her have her private moment, and then you know, we came back. Okay. All right. I was just curious because I, I think you know, sometimes with artistic minded people, they get kind of almost like tunnel vision that oh, we have to get this or this is such a great moment but then there's a line there at some point where it's like you know we need to respect this person too and you're already a friend with her so it's like it's probably fairly easy i would think for you to know you know let's this is a little bit too much we need to step out of the room right now yeah yeah no she she never said anything about like we we were about like you you saw the documentary she's she spoke about anything and everything um so i i wasn't gonna push on something that we had agreed upon already, you know, and shoot it for what reason? So I can then later twist her arm and, you know, include it, you know, th that becomes more, um, what do you call it? Um, 
sensational um, rather than, you know, I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in, you know, her essence and uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and you're right. She, she was extremely candid during the documentary and it makes sense. And it, it's, I think it's a, a testament to you that of how you want to capture her essence and not try to have like clickbait material within this. And oh, you know, if you watch this documentary, there's a one scene when this happens and it's like, you know, that's just a bunch of garbage. <laughs> from my well, yeah, and, yeah, and I mean, the the there was a big push from like uh, certain people in my team and you know, I did a, I did about 15 test screenings and people would say, why don't you start the film with the Oscar, you know? And I was like, well, she's way more than just the Oscar. And even, I didn't want to use the Oscar that you can actually go and see on, you know, YouTube. So we found a way to use it, which was all behind the scenes. It was like her getting ready. And then it was her mother's reaction to her winning, what, that was what was so important to me. Like I was so grateful to have found that footage of her mother watching the television of Olympia getting an, you know, winning the Oscar. So there was nothing in there, and and even like the two, three, three or four uh, clips from her other films, we put in there. They they accentuated the the theme of what was happening at that point point in the documentary it wasn't just to throw in you know famous one-liners from steel magnolias or whatever you know so um i i just wanted everything to work i wanted everything to be there for a reason um yeah yeah well and it was very well done because I, I love that um that viewpoint that you had because it, it, yeah, it just made the flow of the of the film work instead of it being like, here's this thing that for the most part, I think when I'm watching this documentary, they're gonna know that she won the Oscar and they're gonna know for what film and, and yeah. maybe see the acceptance speech and all that kind of stuff. And like you said, I had never seen anything about her mom's reaction to when that happened. So that, that was amazing to see that kind of thing. That was such a, a better take on things than doing it the other way. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and uh, I'm curious, uh, since you've known her and then obviously spent so many hours upon hours upon hours filming her, what part of her, um, perhaps her essence or her as a person that resonates with you as a person? You know, it's the whole package. It's, it's she, she's, oh God, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm extremely inspired by her. I mean, I'm inspired by her constant uh, need to explore and question and um, her kindness towards people, her um, vulnerability, like somebody with her success could go somewhere and be like, hey, all, I'm like, I'm the Academy Award winning Olympia Dukakis, you know, bow to me. She never does that. She goes into all her work uh, being afraid, being worried, you know, do I, am I good enough? Um, which makes her, I think, more, uh, you know, her characters to be more authentic and more real. Um, her relationship to her husband is a huge inspiration to me. Like, how how do I want to be in my relationship? Um, the, the amount of respect that they had for each other, the humor, the, um, you know, giving each other space, the trust. Um, so, it's a, it's a, you know, I, I always joke about this, but it's, it's true. I, I do feel like doing this documentary was kind of like me getting my PhD in life, you know, it was a huge life lesson. I, I think I'm a different man than if I had not done this, you know. Yeah, no, that, and that was, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that because I think it makes sense where. Um, certain things happen in your life and sometimes you can't plan on it um, and it has such a profound effect on you and like I know in my own case again doing these I was invited by a band from LA to go on a virtual tour and at the time I was going to say no <laughs> so I was I was like, that sounds like a lot of work and I've never done this before and it's just sounds I just kind of I was trying to talk myself out of it and then but the fact that some part of me said yes why don't you go ahead and do this and that we ended up doing it for many many shows um, I'm so grateful to those people and it's completely changed my trajectory. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. This is live stream number 155 since May of last year. Wow. And prior to that, I, again, I hadn't done none, zero zilch. 
but I have that band to thank and it's completely changed how I look on things and even just trying something new. It's like, remember what happened last May? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they, they, they take you out of your comfort level, you know, and the, and the thing I think that I related to Olympia was, you know, there's this like glittery Academy Award that everybody knows of, you know? So it's like, we think of Oscar winners as these like creatures from outer space that have a perfect life and they get their Oscar and they're, you know, just wonderful. And what you see is that the struggle, the intense darkness of her life, right? And I related to that. I was, you know, as an artist, I, I went through and I go through that darkness, you know? And I was like, that's what I wanna show. I don't wanna show the glitter. I don't wanna show, you know, that everything is perfect. I wanna show the struggle because that's how, people relate because we all go through struggles. And if I, if, you know, you can inspire someone, but just by showing the positive things. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it really, it really changed my mind. And then you can, you know, we can even talk about the great mother and the whole feminist aspect of the film and how that blew my mind and, you know, created, new knowledge that I had no idea and broke down walls and barriers that I've had since childhood, you know, about stuff like that. So that's a whole different chapter. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I, I think that's one of the aspects that I, uh, resonated with me when she was talking about being at Boston University and being a fencer and then not really feeling, fitting in with other than her friend with the rest of the girls there mm -hmm. like, came from a different area. And then, you know, being uh, what she considered ethnic um, and her last name was eventually not getting her even auditions for jobs. So I don't well, that basically, fuck you. I'm going to create my own theater company yeah. and make my own work and do what I want to do. That was incredibly inspiring to me because as someone who's Asian and grew up in a suburb that was 99% Caucasian, that was me. I didn't fit in there, but it's like, this is all I knew. Um, I didn't have the... Um, wherewithal that she had to go create my own thing at the time. But I totally resonated when I was watching the documentary. I was like, wow, I had no idea that she was going through so many struggles early on in her career. And that's, yeah, I, I love the fact that you chose to go and th show all the ups and downs, all the, the dark parts and the nicer parts or whatever you want to call it, because that's, that's reality for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think she even said during, during your documentary when um, you had asked about uh, the star on the Walk of Fame, and she's kind of like, you know, it's always nice to be acknowledged anytime by your peers, but it doesn't really mean much to her because it's like, well, what's the next project? What's the next thing that I'm doing? Yeah. And and that that scene, by the way, was the hardest scene to work on in the editing room. We spent months trying to make it work and it just wasn't working. And then I finally decided that it's not gonna happen. I called my the the head editor, who was basically working you know, as an as a consultant at that point, and said, you know, Andrew, I just I don't want to do this. I, I I hate this scene. Like it just not work. I can't figure it out. And he said, you know, he he gave us like two three points and said, just try one more day, just today, just work one more day, and then we kind of like figured out that thing where you know it's all great glitter, you know, the funny part, and then the everything is excited, and then at the end of the scene we hear her honest opinion, which basically, you know, breaks down everything that you've seen before. Uh, and we're like, okay, this works. <laughs> but it was literally like, like it was, you know, uh, life or death that day. It was gonna be like, either we keep it or we uh, we fix it or it's, it's out. And thank God we figured it out. Yeah, no, it's, it's an amazing scene. And I love hearing that, it, well, maybe not for you, but for someone like me that was watching that, it took you so much time to get that scene the way you wanted it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think these are the pieces that people that watch films, they have no idea that, uh, including myself, until I start talking to people, like how much work goes on behind the scenes to finally get what you see on your TV or in the theater or what have you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, 90 minutes later, then you walk out and you go, okay, that was nice. Or you might even be dismissive of it. It's like, oh, I don't like this film. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I just spent six years on this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, I was a dancer and I went, you know, the whole thing of you go to a dance performance and if, if, if you think that you can do what the dancers can do, that means that was a successful dance performance. You know, they make it look effortless and so easy. So that's the same thing with filmmaker filmmaking. You know, you, you want people to, to go in and just get in, 
and you know think that it's easy that you can create that really fast and so that's a that's a good thing you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a great point i think uh, what's that that phrase that somebody said that uh, professionals make uh, are the you know, professionals make the difficult look easy yeah exactly yeah and um, not to take too far of a side road, but you just mentioned that you have a, a dance background. Can you kind of tell me a bit about that? I'm just curious. Yeah, I um, I was a professional dancer. I you know I graduated from the Alvin Ailey School in New York. Um, continued taking dance classes after that. Started auditioning. Started working with different dance companies. Then started my own dance company, which I've had for seven years. Um, I was turning 32 33 my body was like just falling apart you know like slid discs knees hips you got you know you name it and um i went with a friend of mine we were interested in getting our masters in um, choreography at nyu and we went to see the department there we weren't really thrilled about it and she said i'm interested in going seeing the film department so i just went with her as a companion, you know, because we were there in the building. Um, and then they started talking about the department and I was like, well, wait, wait, you know, you can learn how to make films, what do you mean? <laughs> and um, I was blown away, literally. And I remember saying, you know, can I have an application? And the woman said, Susan Carnival was her name. Um, she said, you only have two weeks left for the deadline. You're not gonna make it. The application is really intense. So don't worry about it, you know, next year. So I said, well, just give it to me just in case. So I basically went home and I stayed home for two weeks, did the application, submitted it, and forgot about it. And then they called me for an interview. And then from the interview, they called me and they said I was in. Like, And I kept my dance company for two of the three years because you know, I wasn't sure what, what, you know, what was happening. What, what, did, what did I want to do? We were just getting started to like people know the name of our company and um, then you know going full-time on full-time film school and full-time dance company i was like falling apart and at some point i was like okay one has to give and um yeah so i decided that i needed to stick around with uh, film and say goodbye to dance okay yeah I I'm fascinated by that because as I've been doing eclectic arts, I've branched out into, so I cover the Pacific Northwest Ballet here. I cover the Seattle Opera here. Um, there's areas that I, I'm not a dancer. I don't know much about any of this. I love hearing about other people's stories. And and then also, yeah, I've been, I was trying to learn about it before the pandemic hit. <laughs> um, and eventually I'll get back to seeing things, you know, in person. I actually have a, a P and b thing to cover tonight uh, virtually. So uh, mm. that's awesome that um, you have that background. So do you think, um, is there going to be a, a melding of those two areas of your dance background and filmmaking, like making something related to dance on film? Listen, you can't get the dancing out of a dancer. Like, you know, um, some teacher of mine at NYU at, somebody said, at, some, at some point said to me, Harry, you're not a dancer anymore. You got to think as a filmmaker, meaning because I had too much movement in my cameras. Like I love, you know, long shots that travel and da 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 da. Um, and for a while, I was like, oh, maybe she's right. And then I was like, what? You know, that's who I am. That's part of my, that's what makes me me, you know? So I um, I embrace it. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of dance in my films, you know? And I think even with Olympia, um, I feel, I feel that, you know? So of course, yeah, it affects me, I think, in everything. Okay, and uh, I I can see I probably because people have asked me about the same thing that you, I could see you doing if, if it's not a documentary, but it could be a completely just a feature film with something the dance within that film or something because of your background and then just yeah covering all the I, things you love. I, I mean, I, I did do a a short film that I shot in Spain with uh, with actors. I mean, real actually, I use real people, marionettes, and flamenco dance. Um, so that was, I think, the most dance related uh, um, film that I've done, but I am definitely heading towards some dance, you know, film. Awesome. Yeah, no, that again, it makes perfect sense to me and that, yeah, it'd be, 
um, you know, excited to see what you come up with in the future, putting all those things together. I love that when artistic people start pulling from all aspects of their background and says, let's try putting all this in a pot because <laughs> yeah. it's all representation of you. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, wow. And um, it just kind of dawned on me. I think if I remember right through some of my research that um, Olympia was supposed to make, make its debut or premiere a year ago, right? During the pandemic. Yes. We were supposed to come out in theaters on March 2020. So around February, they're like, Ooh, it's not going to happen, we don't think. Let's push it to July. By then, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, we did not have a theatrical release. Um, I feel blessed that we had a year of festivals where you know I traveled and I actually got to see the film with audiences in the movie theater. So that was wonderful, but we didn't have a theatrical release. We had a virtual um, opening. Okay, so uh, when you heard that the uh, premiere or the release in theaters back in March of last year was delayed because of COVID, did that give you any sense of relief or was it kind of a sheer disappointment of like, oh, damn. No, disappointment. Okay. Disappointment because we were so excited about you know, opening in New York and LA. Like that was the first step. Um, she's a New Yorker. We're like, oh my God, you know, people. We, we had three screenings in New York. You know, we premiered at Doc NYC, which is uh, the, the documentary film festival here in New York. 500 people, we sold out. Um, then we had at the Museum of, Mo Museum of Moving Image in Queens, another screening um, sold out. So we were expecting, you know, the people to come out for her. And then, yeah, so it was huge disappointment. And also no one knew what to do. No one, the experts didn't know what was happening. You know, the people in the industry who've been doing this for years were like, ah, give us some time to figure, like, you know, our distribution company was like, I, we don't know. We don't know what's going on. Um, but again, you know, silver lining is when you, when there's such challenges there, you start thinking outside the box. And we've, you know, we've managed to create opportunities where I think if we had gone that route, I don't know if as many people would have seen the film. Like this far, we opened last week um, digitally. And uh, at the day we opened, we had already screened it to about 15,000 people where we would do corporate screenings or organize, you know, we would find organizations or nonprofits and we would do a screening and they would, you know, show it to their employees or their members. Um, so we found ways to get our film in front of people, which was important to me from the very beginning, you know? Um, so there's the, you know, good and bad in everything. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, that makes sense. Uh, I think the only reason that I was kind of asking about that is that uh, there was someone that I talked to that when they had something similar and when the pandemic hit, it actually gave them time to go back and re-edit things because they weren't really 100% happy with it. So that, uh, there's like a weird blessing in disguise that, oh, we got some more time to actually fix things that I wasn't really happy with. Um, because yeah, they're trying to like bum rush it out. Um, but so. well, you know, we were doing that for our March release. So we were re-edit like the festival, um, the premiere was 2018, November. There was a year of festivals. At the end of 2019, we started re-editing the, you know, what we wanted to bring out to, to the theaters. So, you know, but we were done. We, we, we were on time. Like we didn't need extra time. So it was like more of a disappointment, disappointment for us. Like, uh. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, everyone kind of made a collective sound just like that. <laughs> 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 all, all through last year and still into part of this year, although I think it's starting to feel like at least there's some level of hope now for transition and things to uh, get us back to you know what we love. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so it kind of makes me wonder, so what do you have coming up? Are you working on something? Is something already in the can? Are you editing something new? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, sh I've already shot my second documentary, which is... Um, also Cinema Verite, we followed two, a gay couple in Dallas. Uh, they've been together for 35 years, artists. And it's kind of like a, um, you know, kind of like a 
love story filled with resentment and you know uh, bitterness and a lot of humor and um, kind of like a film about you know second chances in love. Uh, will they will they be able to you know keep their the relationship going? And um, so I'm waiting to finish with Olympia so I can have time to fundraise and start editing that. And I'm also producing a an experimental documentary um, of this um, director from Cyprus who lives in New York, and it's a and it's it takes place in Cyprus. And uh, I don't know if many people know about that Cyprus is divided, like uh, Turkey invaded a third of the island. So you have the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, and this director goes in and films everywhere, um, kind of like trying uh, to say we're all the same, you know, like there is no differences on this island, you know, um, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful piece. And um, we are editing, uh, you know, we've been editing during the pandemic. Okay, so when you were um, back in film school studying things, did you want to become a documentary filmmaker? Or were you looking more at feature? <laughs> I was so snotty <laughs> about about documentaries. Oh my god! I you wouldn't you wouldn't have caught me. What's the expression? You could you wouldn't have caught me uh, dead. I don't know the expression, but like no, I did not want to take any documentary classes. I didn't. I looked down upon the form, um, and I thought I was going to be the next Martin Scorsese. You know, doing narratives and uh, so. Um, I mean, it was really by chance, uh, fate that I got into it because I had spent three years writing my first feature and I had a, the feature was going to take place in Cyprus. I had submitted it to the Ministry of Culture in Cyprus in 2011. And that's when the financial collapse happened in Cyprus. So there was no money. So my film was kaput and I was like, well, what do we do now? What do I do with my life? Like, I don't have anything else to do. And I started, you know, and writing is creative, but you, you're alone in, the, you know, for three years, you're alone, you know? So I felt I was suffocating. And when my husband, after the Carl Channing documentary said, you know, why don't you do the film? My initial reaction was like, no, I don't do documentaries. Um, but then the, when I started thinking about it, I was like, oh my God, actually I can just take my camera I don't have to run. I have a camera. I can just go out and shoot her and I don't need money. So I, you know, it's easy. Um, so that's how I decided to do it because I was feeling stuck. Um, of course, as I started filming, I started loving it. As I started editing, I completely got addicted to it. I, I, to, I love it. I love editing. Like it just, you know, it, it's the best. So, I watch a lot more documentaries than I watch narrative films now. I am in love with the form. <laughs> I appreciate it and understand it. So yes. Okay, it's, isn't it interesting that um, you know in your your film school days that you're thinking, oh yeah, no, I would never do that kind of thing, and then yeah. here we are in 2021, and you're working like on your third one or what? Have yeah, exactly. you. <laughs> Yeah, life, yeah. life can be strange that way sometimes. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. So, is there any recent documentaries that you've seen? These recent in, in terms of that you've seen that could have been filmed, you know, years ago that you recommend? Well, my favorite documentary, I think, of all time is Marwan Call. It's an older documentary. It's um, M A R W E N C O L. It's a made up word. Um, yeah, um, capturing the Freedmans is another one. Um, yeah, I would say this too. Okay, I, I'm just thinking. I, I've had the the pleasure of, uh, well, obviously, <laughs> of reviewing some some documentaries uh, in the last year or so, uh, including yours. Um, I know for my myself that one of them was called Collective, which I think is up for an Oscar or something. It's um, about the the hospital and healthcare situation in, I want to say, Romania, which is completely corrupt. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard about that. Yes. yes. Yeah. It, oh. It, Go very ahead. Well, 
very well done, extremely intense, and there's no spoilers from me. I'll just say that um, you know, what that's about. But yeah, and I'll tell you my favorite documentary of this year, uh, "The Thief and the Painter." Hmm, what's that about? It's about this woman in Sweden, I think, where uh, she's a painter, and then she has an exhibition, and somebody, two men, break in and steal some of her paintings, and she finds them. She finds one of them, and and so it's the relation. So she asks him to come, so she can paint him, and it's the relationship between the thief and the painter. It is stunning. I don't know why it was not nominated uh, for an Oscar. It is brilliant, brilliant. I just wrote it down. I'll have to check yes, it out. Please, please do. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, that's that's amazing, and. Um, when you, say, and you keep saying over and over during the course of this interview how much you fell in love with the editing part of this process. So do you ever see yourself being just strictly an editor on a project where you're not directing, producing? No, no, no. When I say I fell in love with the, <laughs> with the editing, I don't actually do the editing. I'm not very technically savvy in the editing okay. thing. But I, you know, I sit next to the editor every day, all day, and, you know, uh, work with them, uh, and that's what I love. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, thanks for the clarification. It reminds me of like, <laughs> be like me if I was in a recording studio. It's like I know what I want to hear, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do with those buttons. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have so much respect for editors. My God, it is so it takes such a long time, and it's all tweaking and like fixing and. I would go crazy. I would, you know, my brain doesn't work like that. And yeah. Okay. Well, and like you mentioned that you have, uh, you know, things that you're working on and you're finishing up the, the round of things with Olympia right now. So is there a feature in there that's not a documentary based thing that you're also either percolating on or getting ready to move at some point? I, yes, I'm just starting to write one um, based on the true story that happened to our family. Okay. Interesting. Um, sounds like it might be intense. Very. <laughs> <laughs> and so just out of, out of curiosity, so were you born in, in Greece? I was born in Cyprus. Um, but at the age of 10, my family started traveling in different countries. We lived in England for two years, Iraq for a year, and then Bahrain, where I did my high school. Uh, it's a tiny little island near Saudi Arabia. Um, and then went back to Cyprus and did my military service and left again. Okay. All so right. I'm kind of like a cosmopolitan kid. I relate more with people who have lived in different places rather than people who, you know, come from Cyprus or, yeah. Okay. So, um, a lonely existence, Mark, a lonely existence. We don't have reunions. We don't have like, you know, high school reunions because, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're in different places in different yeah. times yeah. growing up. Um, so did you um, relate then to some of the discrimination things that Olympia herself talks about in the film being, um, as she called it, ethnic and being from Greece? And is that things that you also encountered? I encountered that very much so in England. Um, you know, I was 11, 11 to 13 and my dad was working in London, but he did not want us to live in London because it was too dangerous. <laughs> so he put us in the suburbs, you know, in, the, in Surrey, like 45 minutes south of London. And we were in a, I was in a school that I was the only foreign kid, the only one. They were all, they were all English, you know, white kids. And there I was like, you know, from Cyprus and. Uh, it was like, you bloody foreigner, go home. I didn't speak any English. So they were like, swear at me. And I was like, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of fist fights. Um, yes, I felt that, yeah. But once we moved, you know, to Iraq and to Bahrain, it was an international, international schools. It was like a safe heaven. Everybody was different. There was so much diversity, you know, sexual orientation, religion, race. It didn't matter, you know. We were there for really a fast time. We, you know, we connected. Um, those were the best years of my life. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about high school being horrible. For me, it was like, oh, <laughs> it was great. Um, 
but yeah, England was definitely a, a hard one. Okay, next. Um, and when did you first come over to America? I came here after the after the military to go to school. Um, and funny enough, I also started at Boston University, like Olympia, but I didn't last there. Um, I ended up graduating from Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, so yeah, I came to study and um, I just fell in love with it and, um, you know, and stayed. All right, and I, I can't not t bring this up during this. Oh, I always, hopefully, do, do you still have time? I want, I should check on that. Are you, are you okay with time? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you have all the time in the world. I, oh. I, <laughs> I was like <late> coming in. <laughs> awesome. Um, what was it like for that scene when you're shooting? Um, this is a spoiler for people watching this, so if you need to turn it off, go ahead for a few minutes. About um, in the film with the turtle on the beach. Oh my God. Um, you know, God, there's so many stories about that turtle. That turtle was magical. That turtle helped me get $53,000. <laughs> That's a side story. Mm -hmm. um, but we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into when they said we were at this resort in South of Greece. And they said, by the way, there was this turtle that came out to give birth, was attacked by wild dogs. It got injured. We, you know, we brought it back to health and we're going to release it today. So it's going to be a big event. Do you guys want to go see it? And Olympia's like, oh yeah, this would be great for, for something to do with my family. So they arranged, the whole family was going to go there. The day of, the family has disappeared. We can't find them anymore. <laughs> like none of the kids, none of the grandkids. Um, and... Uh, so we're like, okay, well, let's just go alone. So we, we go there. And in my mind, I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, I, I really thought that it was going to be like this little turtle that, you know, they were going to put in the sand and, the, you know, people would clap. <sighs> when they take the turtle out of the box and it's a gigantic, like the whole, everybody there, just there was a gasp. And... I couldn't even concentrate on Olympia. Like all I could do is just like watch. It was like National Geographic. All of a sudden we became National Geographic. And, and it was so beautiful and so magical. Like the whole energy. Um, I knew that right there and then. And I, I didn't know that about many scenes. Two scenes. Like the four women and the turtle were the scenes that as I was filming, I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be in the film. Um, so yeah, it was, um, you know, how we edited it at the end, I, you know, that came in the editing room. I had no idea about that, the great amphitheater, you know, and the turtle and the intercutting and all that stuff that, that was much later, but yeah, it was, a, it was a, it was a mystical and spiritual experience for me. That's I, I, why well, I think it comes across on screen uh, for just someone like myself who wasn't even there, just watching that whole scene unravel the way it did. And uh, you mentioned there is a, a large sum of money attached to that turtle. So what's, I have time if you don't mind telling that. Story. No, no, no. And can I just tell you that every time in every theater we did during the film festival year, and we did a lot of theaters, every time that turtle shows up, there's a gasp in the audience. It is like, you know, um yeah so you know we finished shooting Greece and we're like we need money we need money we have to raise money so we found out that there was this woman from Lowell Massachusetts born a year before Olympia who became a multi 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 millionaire in chemicals um she was also responsible she's responsible for generic drugs she's the one that basically brought generic drugs to the to, to the people she's the one responsible who gave us the $20 Met tickets at the, at the opera because she felt like art, you know, her name was uh, Agnes Baris. So she passed away from cancer and she left millions and millions of dollars to a trust. And there was three men, one Greek American who were responsible in giving the money in the causes that she, you know, cared about. So you couldn't apply for funding, right? You had to be invited. So we found out that they had given money to this uh, magnet school in Brooklyn that deals with the classics, with the Greek classics, and they had given money to build a theater. 
and they were going to open. It was like the opening, grand opening of the theater. So we're like, we crashed the party. My executive producer, myself, we just showed up, pretended that we were part of the of the group there. And um, we find him. My executive producer goes and speaks to him. She invites me over and says, this is Harry Moromikalis. He's doing a documentary on Olympia Dukakis. This is, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, he said, I met Olympia Dukakis, you know, a few years ago. And I said, oh, where did you meet her? And he said, you know, it was this random place. It was like this beach and there was this turtle <laughs> that they were going to release. Uh, and all of a sudden it clicked. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I remember you. I said, not only I remember you, I filmed you. I have you on video because they were having a conversation with Olympia. They were basically doing some banter about the, you know how the turtle would stop Mm-hmm. And then, it, then it would like, then it would move, and you know, they started going, "Oh, look at her! Look at her. she! She likes the the attention. You know, she's building up the tension, the drama." And you know, so his wife comes. We start, to, you know, continue talking, and she, you know, she remembered the whole thing, and she says, "Well, why don't you, why don't you send me an email with your like with your application?" Like at that moment, she invited us to apply. And um, I go home, I go through my footage, I find the footage, and I basically create this little like two minute clip between Olympia and this stranger, stranger who we had no idea that he was in charge of millions of dollars, right? So we send the application. <laughs> I send the application by email and I send that little video. And then th- two weeks later, we had $53,000. That's amazing. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on, like crazy, craziness. Like these things don't happen, you know, it's only in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's like you were saying earlier, you never know who you're talking to. Yeah, exactly. You exactly. had no idea when you're filming that scene there on the beach that some of the people in the crowd, you're going to see, you know, connected to something later that can help you with your end product. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> small well, world. Small, small world. world. But, the, but the turtle connected it, connected the dots for us. <laughs> Thank goodness for that turtle. I know. <laughs> and for the people that, you know, rescued it and re- rehabilitated it, obviously. But, um, and wow. let's, let's uh, also, let's not forget her name, Lola. Yeah, just all, all the things that uh, came from that. That, that really is a, a, a whole magical scenario, really, that yeah. happened and connected so many people from so different, many different areas. And um, this yeah. is real, real life magical realism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think you can uh, make that up. <laughs> that story. Oh my gosh. Well, Harry, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk about Olympia and everything else. I really enjoyed this, and I love the film. And for people that are watching this, you can obviously see there. It says, you know, go to OlympiaTheFilm.com. You can watch it on demand right now on the platform that you that you'd like to do that on. But um, I really um, would love to talk to you about any time you have any other project coming up, and it's something you do if you want to start promoting it or just to pick your brain about the new process for the new documentaries that you have coming up. I would love to reconnect in the future. I'd love that, and thank you so much. This was wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, for the people who go out and see the film, I invite you to follow us on social media also, which is uh, like at, at Olympia the film. And let us know what you think of the film. Like, let us know about your experience. We we love to hear people's reaction, good or bad. <laughs> awesome. Well, there you go. So um, again, Harry, thank you so much for taking the time. Stay safe over there where you're at. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the the work that you have coming out in the future. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate this. This was wonderful. Awesome. Have a good night over there. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.